morning and welcome to the service this morning. We're going to begin by taking our hymnals, turning to hymn number 238, please. As we stand and sing, I must tell Jesus. pray, let's uh, read today's scripture. So if you'll turn with me to the book of Daniel, chapter 6, we'll read verses 10 through 20. Starting in verse 10, Daniel chapter 6. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed, and gave thanks before his God as he did previously. Then these men assembled and found David praying and making supplication before his God. Then they came near and spoke before the king concerning the king's decree. Hast thou not signed a decree that every man that shall ask a petition of any god or man within thirty days, except of thee, O king, shall he be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing is true according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. Then answered they and said before the king, That Daniel, who is of the children of the captivity of Judah, regardeth not thee, O king, nor the decree that thou hast signed. 
but maketh his petition three times a day. Then the king, when he heard these words, was very much displeased with himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him, and he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. Then these men assembled unto the king and said unto the king, Know, O king, that the law of the Medes and Persians is that no decree nor statue which the king established may be changed. Then the king commanded, and they brought Daniel, and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spoke and said unto Daniel, Thy God, whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. And a stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords, that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and passed the night fasting, Neither were instruments of music brought before him, and his sleep went from him. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste unto the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel. And the king spoke and said to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God whom thou servest continually able to deliver thee from the lions? Shall we bow our heads in prayer? Our Lord and Heavenly Father, we again do bow before you. We thank you, Lord, that uh, you are the ultimate power of the universe. We thank you that you were willing to come and to live a life uh, that we live and to lay that life on the cross. Lord, we thank you that you were able to conquer sin and death on the third day. And Lord, we just pray that you will strengthen us all to continue to spread that gospel to our community. Lord, we thank you for this church body, Lord. We just pray that you will lift up everyone in this church. Pray that you will continue to lead us daily into your word and into fellowship through prayer with you. And we just pray, Lord, that we will continue to serve this community and to serve one another. We pray for all the ministries of our church, and we just pray that they will continue to flourish, Lord, and that we will follow your lead and your guide in the administration of all the uh, business that we have here at this church. Lord, we think now of our country, and Lord, we just pray for our nation, Lord. We pray for our leadership. Lord, we just pray that we as Christians will continue to stand up as the government becomes more and more amoral. Lord, we just pray that we will continue to fight for the lives of our our, uh, children. We just pray that we will continue to fight for the rights of uh, our nation and that we will continue to fight for you. Lord, you just think of those in our congregation with health problems. We just pray that you will continue to bless these people, Lord, that you, the great physician, will bring them healing. Think of Steve Benjamin and the trials he's going through now. Lord, we just pray that you will give him healing, Lord, give him relief of any pain that he has. And and Lord, we just pray that you will lift his spirits at this time to get him through this uh, that uh, you have set before him. We think of Shirley Dodge, that uh, she's having a lot of pain through the back, Lord, and we just pray that you'll give her relief of that and, again, lift her spirits through this time of trial. We think of Bob's father and everything that he's going through, Lord, that you'll just continue to be with him, and we think of Jerry Harding as well. We just pray that you'll continue to give him a good spirit, Lord, and to lift his spirits at this time. Lord, we think of any others with health problems. Also, Lord, we think of all of the women in our congregation who are pregnant at this time. We just pray that you will continue to be with them through this and and, uh, help them at this time. Lord, we just pray that you will continue to guide and direct every one of us, that we will uh, serve you in the week ahead. In thy name we ask it. Amen. At this time, before you sit down, if you could greet one another.
find our way back to our seats, we'll be singing, How Can I Keep From Sinning? The song I'm singing today is called To Obey is Better Than Sacrifice, and it's by Keith Green, and it's a song that uh, um, a friend in my youth group introduced me to his, uh, his music like about 40 years ago, 40 years ago. So. <laughs> I don't need your mind. 
high school students. Sunday school, we've been studying uh, not a fan, talking about being a follower, not just a fan of God. And that, I think, went right along with our key verses that we've been going through, uh, where it says uh, to take up your cross daily, uh, Luke 9, 23. And he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. So wonderful song. Thank you, Deanna. Uh, a couple quick announcements. Uh, Tonight will be our Sunday night life groups, youth group, and uh, the children's ministry as well. This Tuesday is our senior fellowship. If you are interested in joining in with that, if you could talk to Amber Newlove, to RSVP, and also uh, if you need transportation. And then this Wednesday will be our KYB and uh adult groups and our teen group on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. Uh, just a little bit of an update from last week um, from the Arise event. Thank you all for praying. Uh, we had over or just around 75 total coming from our church here, uh, adults and teens that were able to go down to that and 225 uh, total from uh, the different communities that came in. And uh, last week, six um, teens from our youth group or that came with kids from our youth group accepted Christ as their Lord. And so praise God for that. Um, yeah. Praise God for that and uh, just pray for us as we go and follow up after that event and uh, reach out to those that are lost in the community. All right. Uh, good morning. I'm glad you got to blow in this morning. Let's have the ushers come forward. We're about to receive our morning tithes and our offerings. And that was a beautiful song. Father, it is our heart's desire to worship you here in your house this morning. And uh, it is so true, like never before, to obey you is better than to sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. So Lord, help us to check ourselves this morning here in this place. And I pray that you'd help us to draw near to you. And now as we contribute to this offering plate. Lord, uh, recognize that in a, a group like this, this represents tremendous sacrifice. So please come and bless this offering. Use it for your great honor, your great glory, your divine purposes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
through every battle, through every heartbreak, through every circumstance. I believe that you are my fortress. Oh, you are my portion, and you are my hiding place. I believe you are. that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of him. I want to walk with you, Jesus. Feel your presence. Know your I want to see you, Jesus, move in power and cast out fear. And 
wish my song to rise to you when temptations come my way and when I cannot stand I'll call on you Jesus you're my hope and sin and Lord I Thank you once again. That was beautiful. Uh, we're in Daniel chapter 6 this morning, please. Daniel chapter 6. I was watching a news conference a couple of weeks ago. This 31-year-old, name was Travis, uh, his name is Travis Kaufman, was jogging just north of uh, the Denver, Colorado area. And on a trail where he was going up and down the trails and came to an open space where he started jogging on some pine needles. And because he could uh, hear his own uh, feet on the pine needles, he started hearing other paw prints behind him. And he, he glanced around and noticed that there was a, a baby mountain lion that was uh, right behind him. And something I don't think uh, you ever prepared for. But... Uh, you may have heard the story, he uh, actually single-handedly took down that mountain lion, managed to maneuver his body around in such a position that he put one of his foot on its uh, uh, throat and the rest is history. He did go to the hospital, actually he had to jog out of that area, caught a ride to the hospital and survived. And I thought to myself, wow, what would it be like to turn around and watch a small mountain lion uh, following you like that and you're, you're defenseless? We're going to see Daniel was placed in a den of lions, and uh, from what I understand, uh, an average-sized lion is a pretty good-sized, hefty fella. He's about four feet uh, tall, and he can be as long as 10 feet long, 400, 400 pounds. And imagine being dropped down into a den of lions, and God himself sent his angel and shutting the mouths of those lions. The subject we're going to be considering together today is the subject of prayer. And as you know, on our journey through the first six chapters of the book of Daniel, I've tried to whittle down what is this chapter talking about? What's the one takeaway point? And as best as I can determine, this is not only uh, the theme of this chapter, but it kind of is woven throughout the entire first chapters of the book of uh, Daniel. What is prayer? Well, a dictionary definition says it's a sincere crying out to God, an expression of thanksgiving dressed, addressed to Almighty God. What I like to think of prayer as absolute dependency upon God. And have you ever been there? <laughs> And done that, where there's no way out of this situation if God doesn't come through. And so uh, on our journey through the first six chapters of the book of uh, Daniel, i got to tell you, it's been very, very instructive for me personally. We took time to just do the first two verses when we first started back in January and saw that uh, Daniel was being prepared as a 16-year-old to go 613 miles into a God-forsaken area. And he wouldn't just survive, but he would thrive in that environment. And we got to see that there was a great pastor in his day named Jeremiah. He was in the background helping Daniel be prepared for this moment. There was a godly king on the throne by the name of Josiah. And 
King Josiah, Jeremiah, I'm sure. I want to meet Daniel's parents in heaven one day, maybe a Sunday school teacher, KYB workers. But there were a variety of people in Daniel's life that prepared him for this great moment. Then in chapter 1, uh, verse 8, we saw where Daniel had backbone. The meal was set before him, and he purposed in his heart he would not stain his conscience. He had conviction. In fact, I heard somebody say that uh, because Daniel chose not to eat in chapter 1, the lions didn't eat him in chapter 6. Someone else said that uh, Daniel was half grit, half backbone. Maybe that's why the lions didn't eat him. Daniel had some real conviction. He purposed in his heart he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat. And then in chapter 2, God hauled off and gave us four Gentile empires that would come before they actually came. And we made a point how that if you're going to go down to Babylon and not just survive but thrive down there, you're going to need to know biblical perspective. What is God doing in the past? What's he doing in the present? And what's God going to do in the future? That will help you uh, thrive down in Babylon. Then we saw the three Hebrew boys placed in the fiery furnace and how they just uh, trusted God and God came uh, through to deliver them as well. Their perseverance and priority. King Nebuchadnezzar had to be reduced to a wild beast for seven years until he learned James chapter 4 and verse 6, which says God resists the proud, but he's in the business of giving grace to the humble. Have you learned that valuable lesson? Last week we talked about having pure eyes. God is able to show you things that other people can't see. Uh, Matthew 5 verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart. They get to see God at work in their lives. But we're talking about prayer this morning. How many of you have checked your cell phone this morning? Don't raise your hand. Is it your custom, right, when you get out of bed to check your cell phone? How many of you check it at noon? And how many of you check it right when you go to bed three times a day or more? I read recently where the average college student spends nine hours a day on their cell phone. That's a lot of time. In verse 10 is one of my favorite verses in this chapter. It says that Daniel, when he learned that the decree had been signed, he went to his house, opened the windows, and he prayed like he always did three times a day, morning, noon, and night. That reminded me of a lady on New Year's Day this year who was just east of Tampa, Florida. It's early in the morning. You know, Tampa, Florida is right on the Gulf Coast, and the fog had rolled in pretty thick that morning. And she was about to exit, I think it was exit 311, and somebody cut her off, and she tried to overcorrect, and she ended up going over and over and over, down into a watery, muddy, an emphasis on muddy uh, ditch, and her car began to sink. But she's a 20-year-old, or 33-year-old, and she, uh, she knew her cell phone really, really well. And so she contacted dispatcher. Dispatch sent a couple of deputies out her way, and they searched that neck of the woods, couldn't find her. Remember, the fog had rolled in. Her car is upside down. There's nothing to reflect. They sent two deputies out, three deputies out, four deputies. After a while, there were 13 deputies combing that neck of the woods before they found her. Meanwhile, her car is sinking and sinking and sinking. She had the presence of mind because he, she knew her cell phone so well. She got on Google Map, dialed it up, her specific location. And these two gentlemen, by the way, these are the backbone of our country right here. These uh, are law enforcement. They went down in this watery, muddy ditch, and they managed to rescue her right in the nick of time. You want? I wonder... Do you know God that way? Are you so close with God that you're in perpetual contact with him? Any situation that arises on your radar, you could dial God up and he can get to you and rescue you. I mean, for Daniel, it was just another day at the office. He was in a lion's den and he prayed and asked God to preserve him. And God dispatched his angel and shut the mouth of the lion. Now, I want you to see way over at the end of this chapter, we're going to kind of go into the back door. But look at verse 25 of chapter 6. King Darius wrote to all the people, Instagrammed it, just put it out there on Facebook, nations and languages that dwell in the, all the earth, peace be multiplied unto you. 
I'm making a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, and by the way, this kingdom, it, just, it was a sprawling kingdom when you look at it on an aerial view. It went way over past Afghanistan and Pakistan, way over to modern-day India. Massive kingdom. Had 120 governors, which we'll see in just a moment. But look at verse 26. I make this decree that in every dominion of my kingdom men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God. He's steadfast forever, and his kingdom, that which cannot be destroyed, his dominion shall be even unto the end. He has delivered he is the God who extracts or rescues, and he works signs and wonders in heaven and in earth, and he has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. What Daniel did in secret and private, this king spread it throughout the known world that Daniel served a living God who's able to intervene and deliver and, if necessary, extract his people from their particular uh, difficulty. In other words, Daniel lived in such a way that it was his decisions that revealed to the world, I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. And I know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, guess what? He's always near. Is that your testimony? This was Daniel's testimony. So I want to approach this chapter that way this morning. What was it about Daniel's prayer life? And what is it about your prayer life that will enable you to have others around you see that you serve a risen, living Savior who's capable of meeting your difficult need right in the nick of time? Well, as I approach this chapter that way, I notice, first of all, Daniel had some very godly character. In fact, look with me at verses 1 and 2. It pleased Darius, and that name, Darius, means Lord. I mean, just that name spelled that he was the top dog. And what we're doing in this chapter, we're moving... From Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar's kingdoms, which were dictatorships, we're moving now, we're transitioning to a democracy. Watch how this goes down. Verse 1 says, It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 princes as rulers, which should be over the whole kingdom. And over these, he had three presidents. So you got 120 rulers, over them three presidents, of whom Daniel was first that the princes might give accounts unto them, and the king should have no damage. See, now they start collecting taxes. And you know, anytime you start collecting taxes, things can go south real quick. 2010 major earthquake down in Haiti. Billions of dollars were raised. How much of it actually got to the people who had real needs? Anytime you're dealing with lots of money, it can go south quickly. The ruler, Darius, asked Daniel to be in charge over the three presidents who were over the 120 rulers. He had integrity. You know what integrity is? You ever heard of the word integer? If you're awake that day in math class, it's a whole number. Next week we'll do fractions, but today we're doing integers. Daniel was a complete person. And that's what integrity means, right? Inside and outside, I'm the same person no matter where I'm at. And no matter where you might find me, I'm the same person. Here's a half person described in Scripture. Psalm chapter 66, verse 18 says, If I regard sin or iniquity in my heart, God will not hear that. I can come to church and I can sing with the best of them. But you remember what Jesus said in his Sermon on the Mount? If I bring my gift to the altar and I remember I have ought against my brother, I should leave that gift there, go make it right with my brother, then come and offer that gift. He wants genuineness in his worship services. Daniel was that kind of a person. He was the kind of person who had a good name. He lived in such a way that King Darius could come to him and say, Hey, Daniel. I want you to be in charge over the three presidents and the presidents over the 120 governors which will oversee my empire. Daniel, would you do that? And Daniel did it. 
Proverbs says, A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and loving favor than silver and gold. I found it interesting this morning that uh, Deanna would uh, mention this passage of Scripture because I'm going to list it here in just a moment right next to this umbrella. I could have just skipped right over this, but I think there's a real need in our local churches for our young people especially to understand God-ordained authority. Daniel understood. I believe that's why God propelled Daniel to the very top. What is God-ordained authority? You look in the New Testament, God has ordained family, husbands and wives, parents to oversee their children. He's ordained governments. He's ordained employers. He's ordained church leaders. And it's for your favor, your benefit, your protection. If I were to remove myself out from underneath that authority, I'm inviting satanic activity into my life. Let me show you what I'm talking about. 1 Samuel chapter 15, the third time God through Samuel came to King Saul. He'd ask him to do three things, and he struck out every single time. The last time through Samuel, God told Saul, he said, listen, Saul, behold, sit up and pay attention, get this, stop what you're doing. To obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen up than the fat of rams. Because rebellion, when I pull myself out from underneath God-ordained authority, I'm opening myself up to satanic involvement in my life. Rebellion is like the sin of witchcraft. Stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. And Daniel understood that very basic principle. No matter where you see him in the book of Daniel, he always understands he is underneath a leader who is ultimately under God's ordained authority. And you'll be better off if you get that nailed down early on in your life. Well, what I like about Daniel in these verses, he didn't just have inner integrity, but his integrity on the inside spilled over to the outside. Look with me in verse 3. You ever met someone like this in verse 3? It says uh, this Darius was, uh, this Daniel rather, was preferred or distinguishable above the presidents and the princes because he had a preeminent spirit which was in him. And the king thought to set him over the whole realm. That fascinates me. He had an excellent spirit. You'd want to be around this guy. He developed inner character and this disposition that expressed itself outwardly that was necessary for successful relationships. You want to know why down at work there are problems? It's not what you do. I mean, you, you know as well as I do. Anymore, you can be replaced by a robot almost. But it's those interpersonal relationships. It's that guy on the other side of the cubicle that you can't get along with. Or the guy down there at the end that you can't get along with. Well, Daniel had been through everything in this book up to this point, and God kept whittling away his character, his character, his character, and he was the kind of man, when you get to chapter 6, integrity on the inside, an excellent spirit on the outside. This man was adored even by unbelieving kings. That fascinates me. He's like the vice president over this entire Medo-Persian empire. How did he get there? This is how character is formed. Your thoughts become words, word becomes deed, deeds become habits, and your habits become character. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5. And beside all this, give diligence to add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and temperance patience, and so on and so forth. We build character one brick at a time every single day of our life, and Daniel had it. I'm thinking, where have I seen an excellent spirit lately? You ever heard of this guy here? He grew up in Jackson, Michigan, which is just west of Ann Arbor. Matter of fact, one day at Detroit Airport, I was sitting there. The plane was delayed, delayed, delayed. I struck up a conversation with the fellow next to me and asked him, where are you from? I'm from Jackson, Michigan. I said, Jackson, Michigan? I just read a book, the autobiography of Tony Dungy. He said, yeah, he grew up across the street from me. I said, he grew up across the street from me? Yeah, we we played ball together in high school and things. I said, what? Tony Dungy went on to become a successful coach in the uh, NFL, and he became the first black head coach to win, what was it, Super Bowl 41. 
I don't know if you remember about a year ago when uh, the uh, Philadelphia Eagles won the Super Bowl, but there was a lot of going back and forth on Twitter because of something he said just before the big game. He knew this coach, or this uh, quarterback, rather, of the Philadelphia Eagles. And uh, they had this conversation where the uh, quarterback said to him that God's been working in my heart. You know, I was going to retire and become a pastor, but was called back to play for the Philadelphia Eagles. And the Holy Spirit has given me great confidence. I think I'm going to do real well today. So he said that on national television. And boy, did the Twitter start going back and forth. One guy writes and said, unbelievable, you'd use your employer, NBC Sports, to spout this nonsense on the air. Tony Dungy wrote back the next morning and said, why would you find it hard to believe that the Holy Spirit can speak to Nick, Nick Foles? He's the quarterback for the Philadelphia Eagles, just as much as the coach could speak to him. If he credited a coach for saying, stay calm and be confident, that's good. But if he tells me Christ says that to him, shouldn't I report it? He is a modern-day Daniel. Publicly, on national television, he's able to stand up with a backbone and say this thing. And notice he's got an excellent spirit. He's got inner character and the excellent spirit which follows. Now, let's go a little further here. Daniel wasn't just controlled by godly character. But the next thing I find in Daniel is that he had a consistent daily walk. These men are going to actually do what they did to Jesus in his day. They're going to send out spies and try to find a flaw, a defect somewhere in Daniel's life. And they won't find it. Have you noticed if they put a camera on you, usually you're a different person? They're going to put these spies on, in Daniel's life, and they're going to try to find a place. And so let's see the deception in verses 4 and 5. Then the presidents and the princes sought to find occasion. I know the NIV says a corruption, which is a good translation. Another translation could be defects against Daniel concerning the kingdom. But they could find an occasion, nor fault, for as much as he was faithful. Man, I love that. They tried to find a little speck in Daniel's life. What if somebody reviewed your life this week? What if they searched your hard drive on your computer, your book collection, magazine collection? They tried to find something that was intentional and even things that were unintentional. But it comes back to say they couldn't find it because Daniel was faithful. What a man. Deception by the princes. Well, now, the next thing that happens in verses 6 through 9 is they go over to the king because they can't find any fault with Daniel. It's, well, we'll try to see the weaknesses of the king here. Notice how this unfolds in verses 6 through 9. So the presidents and the princes assembled together to the king, and they said to him, King Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom and the governors and the princes and the counselors and the captains have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for 30 days except of thee, O king, should be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree, sign and write it, sign and sign the writing that it may not be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. And so wherefore, King Darius, signed the writing and the decree. They couldn't find any dirt on Daniel, but they found a flaw with the king. They patted him on the back, they puffed him up, and they said, hey, king, let's make you king for a month. And by the way, it wasn't uncommon when you search biblical history. The pharaoh down in Egypt thought he was a king. Later on, the Romans, uh, Caesar and his throne over, they thought they were kings. Let's make you king for a month. Said, That's a great idea. We'll sign it right here so it can't be changed. And if anybody prays to any other god for just 30 days, they'll be cast into the den of lions. So... Here we come now to my favorite verse in this entire chapter. Daniel's backbone comes again to the surface. It says in verse 10, Now when Daniel knew the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows were opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem. I love that. Daniel now is placed into a crisis, and one thing a crisis, a crisis will do, it reveals who you really are. It also uncovers what you really believe. You can come to a church like this, stand up and sing with the best of them. You can read scripture. You can nod your head and say amen that you believe it. But sooner or later, if you follow Christ long enough, you will be placed into a crisis. And it's going to reveal 
who you really are and what you really believe. That's what happened to Daniel. But the Bible says he went to his house and his windows were opened in the direction of Jerusalem. Do you know why he prayed in the direction of Jerusalem? I didn't have time to point this out last week. There's so many things that when I get home, I like, man, I could have pointed that out and didn't do it. Do you realize Hebrew is written from right to left? Of course, in English, things are written from left to right. Do you realize Jerusalem is really the center of the earth in God's perspective? Every th all the nations, just think about this, that are uh, east of Jerusalem, right from right to left. All the nations that are left of Jerusalem, right from left to right, like we do here in America. Daniel opened the windows to Jerusalem because that's where the temple used to stand. And that's where in the Old Testament, on two occasions, God told his people when Solomon was dedicating the temple, Solomon said, Lord, if there ever comes a day when your people forsake you and wander away from you, if they turn their face and turn in the direction of Jerusalem and pray, God in heaven promised he would hear, hear their prayer and heal their land, forgive them of their iniquities. So he went to his house, opened his chamber windows in the direction of Jerusalem. Now, now think about this. He's like the Mike Pence of the Medo-Persian uh, Empire. That's a big deal. And we're not talking about some shack that he lived in. He must have lived in a really nice place, a, a plush palace. And yet, they followed Daniel over there and they watched as he, the windows opened and he unapologetically, unashamedly, he prayed in that direction. And where did he get the concept in verse 10 to do it three times a day? I think Daniel knew his Bible through and through. Matter of fact, I know later on in chapter 9, he says he was reading in Jeremiah's prophecy about how this whole thing would go down. Daniel was a man who knew Scripture. Daniel was a man who believed in Scripture to the extent he prayed. And just like David said in Psalm 55, verse 17, Evening and morning and at noon will I pray and cry, cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. I just can't get over this Daniel character. He really was controlled by God. Godly character, consistent in his daily walk. And a matter of fact, I want to develop this a little more before we go any further. So let's go back to verse 10. He says he opened his window chambers toward Jerusalem. And as a sign of humility, he got down on his knees three times a day and he prayed just like he did before. Even though they're watching him, he doesn't change. Verse 11 says, Then these men assembled and they found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. They came over to the king and they rushed over and said, Hey, king, didn't you sign this decree? Well, there's a guy that's violating it. And his name is that Daniel. He's one of the captives. Look at that in verse 13, which is of the children of the captivity of Judah. He doesn't regard you, O king, nor the decree that you've signed, but he makes his petitions three times a day. And so then the king, when he heard these words, was sore displeased with himself, and he set his heart. Notice, this guy likes Daniel. I believe Daniel likes this guy. So he sets his heart on Daniel. To deliver him, and he labored. By the way, it's not just works, but laboring is another uh, level of work. He I mean he was sweating to do this, right? He labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. I found it interesting this week to go back and look what they did with Jesus. Absolutely innocent, yet they nailed him to a cross. In John chapter 18 and 19, on three occasions, Pilate came out to the people. And said regarding Jesus, I've tried him, and I find no fault in him. Three times. And the last time Pilate said that, the people curled up their fist and shook it and said, Crucify him, crucify him. Give us Barabbas and crucify Jesus, the Son of God. Daniel, in other words, was just like Jesus. It says in verse 16, the king commanded and they brought Daniel, cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake and said unto Daniel, your God whom you serve is continually, he'll deliver you. I like that. You serve him continually. The king knew it. Verse 17, and a stone was brought and laid at the mouth of the den. Does that not sound like what they did to Jesus when he, they put him in the 
the grave. They brought a stone and they rolled it there. They, they laid this stone here in verse 17 at the mouth of the den. And notice the king sealed it with his own signet. Doesn't that sound familiar what happened in the Garden of Gethsemane? They rolled that stone and they sealed it with the king's signet. With the signet of his lords that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his place. And passed the night fasting, neither were there instruments of music brought before him, and his sleep went from him. That leads us now to the third section here that the Lord's been showing me this week through Daniel chapter 6. He was controlled by godly character. He was consistent in his daily walk. But at the end of the day, end of the day he was confident that God would deliver him. Maybe deliver him by taking him home to heaven. He believed in the omnipotence and the omniscience of God, that God could do whatever he wanted to do, but he knew at the end of the day, God's will would be done. Daniel means, essentially, there's a greater God who's in charge of my life. God is my judge. Darius or Belshazzar or Nebuchadnezzar, or there are lots of others in that we could introduce at this point, they were just under God's ultimate authority and control. Daniel understood that. He understood at the end of the day, God up in heaven is the one I must stand before and give an account. And God's in control of my life. And because he is in control of my life, every word, every thought, every action, every deed I commit, even the motivation for what I do it for, is going to be brought to bear when I stand before the ultimate judge who is God himself. So you see in verse 18, there's problems back in the palace. We just read it a moment ago. The king couldn't sleep, no music. He couldn't eat. Isn't that interesting? He could eat, but he couldn't. The lions down in the pit, they could eat, but they couldn't because God was closing their mouth by his angel. Problems back in the palace. While providence was taking place down in the pit. Look at verse 19. The king got up early the next morning. Made haste to the den of lions. And when he came to the den. He cried with this lamentable cry or voice. And to Daniel. And the king spake and said to Daniel. Daniel. Servant of the living God. Is your God whom you serve continually. Is he able to deliver you. From the lions. Then said Daniel, verse 21, unto the king, O king, live forever. My God has sent his angel, and he has shut the mouths of the lions, and they have not hurt me for as much as before him innocence, and he was found in me. And also before thee, O king, have I, have I done no hurt? Then was the king exceedingly glad for him, and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no manner of hurt was found upon him, because he believed in his God. Three times a day, Daniel prayed morning, noon, night, facing the temple that once stood there, now in collapsed mode. And after a while, Ezra will take a group back and rebuild the temple. Nehemiah will take a group back and rebuild the walls around the temple. But he prayed in that direction. And God sent his angel and closed the mouth of the lions. I remember one time flying into Zurich, Switzerland and took a bus from Switzerland after a few days. Going up to ultimately Frankfurt, Germany and we rode past some beautiful, beautiful countryside and our tour guide was so excited. He, at one point he said, the next sp stop on our agenda here is to stop at the Black Forest, which is in southern Germany. And I don't know if you know it, but that's where they make a lot of the cuckoo clocks that you may have one in your living room. I don't have one. It would drive me cuckoo if I had a cuckoo clock in my living room. But some of you have those, and it's interesting to me to find out what they did. That come from Black Forest, Germany. Do you know Daniel was like a clock with his character? He would stop whatever he was doing. And three times a day he would go and get on his face before God, kneel there and ask God, for his assistance and aid. I have a friend of mine who used to work in a situation where there was one of the fellows on their team who would just vanish different times of the day. If you were to ask, where is he going? He's Muslim. 
He's going to a private place, putting his prayer shawl out there. He's facing in the direction of Mecca, and he prays five times a day. Kind of puts us to shame, doesn't it? There's someone who believes in what they're doing. And Daniel was that kind of a person. Problem back in the palace, providence down in the pit, and you got to like verse 24. Remember Romans 12 says, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Daniel didn't get upset with those men responsible for throwing him down into the pit. But notice what God did. God intervened, verse 24. And the king commanded, they brought those men which accused Daniel, and they cast them into the den of lions, them and their children, their wives. The lions had the mastery of them, broke all their bones in pieces, or ever they came to the bottom of the den. Isn't that amazing? Kings in those days didn't want any rebellion. That's why he took care of even the next generation. The wives and their children were destroyed. Listen, don't take matters into your own hands. If someone has done you a perceived injustice, learn to pray. I try to pray by the grace of God every day, the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our debt as we forgive those who are indebted toward us. And I have a list of people that I pray for just to take the venom out of my own heart. I just give them to the Lord. Lord, you know more about this than I do. I give them over to you. and I'll let you take care of that because I don't want to get bitter. And I found that God could do a much better job than I can. So that's what's going on here. Daniel just gave them over to the Lord. But I love this. It's going to end where we started now. This is the king. This is his posting it on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, getting it out there, verse 25. He wanted the then known world, all the people, nations, and languages that dwell on all the earth, To know that Daniel serves a God who can free, deliver, and if necessary, to rescue and extract the people that fear him. As a matter of fact, that's what Proverbs 29 verse 25 says. It talks about fear. Fear of man brings a snare. But whoever puts their trust in the Lord shall be saved. You know what a snare is, by the way? It's, it's a trap, but it's an unusual trap. If you're a hunter in this room, you know what a snare is. It's the kind of trap that when you go through it, and it tightens around you, whether your leg or your neck, the more you try to escape, the tighter it gets. Some of you may be there this morning. If you're drifting, wandering from God, and you're ensnared in sins that are so prevalent in our society, sins of the eyes, Sins of the flesh, sins of the spirit. And the more you physically try to extract yourself, the tighter that thing gets. Notice what the proverb says. If you put your trust in the Lord, he can do for you what he did for Daniel. This really spoke to my heart, verse 27. He frees or delivers and he extracts, rescues, and he works signs and wonders in heaven and in earth. He's delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. We serve a great God, do we not? Let me give you some disciplines if you want to take this to heart. Try to make some practical application. You want to be like Daniel? Controlled by godly character. Consistent in his daily walk. Confident in the word of God. You need to get familiar with the Old Testament way the priest went into the Holy of Holies. Now, it's not pictured here, but even before the priest would come into the holy place, there was what was called a brazen altar. That's the first thing he came to. And you would bring your sacrifice, give it to the priest. He would offer that sacrifice on that brazen altar. So there would be blood all over the place. The second piece of furniture, which is not pictured here, but we're getting closer, is called the laver. The priest would then wash his hands. But when he came into the holy place, notice the three pieces of furniture. You walk in and to your right is the table of showbread. One of the disciplines that you need to be like Daniel is to have a timely place in your life where you get along with the Lord. Luke 24 says that Jesus was known to those two Emmaus disciples in the breaking of the bread. Do you have a time in your life where you let God speak to your heart every single day through his word? Notice on the other side of the room there is the candelabra. As I feast on God's word and let him transform my life from within, I'm to be a witness to the world. 
Daniel was a witness to the wicked, heathen, Babylonian culture where he landed on the ground. But what, he's now 86 years old. He's been there for 70, 70 years. He went there as a 16-year-old. He's 86 years old when you read chapter 6. He's been feasting on the manna from heaven. He's been a light to the world. But just before you go into the holiest place of all, there's this altar of incense which represents our prayers which are ascending up before the throne of God even as we speak. Do you have a time of getting along with God? Are you a witness to others around you of His salvation, His power to deliver? And do you spend time in prayer? Well, that's when the priest once a year, according to Leviticus chapter 16, could go into the holiest of all. And there he could offer atonement for the sin of Israel for once a year. What a wonderful photograph of how we can come into God's presence today. Father, I want to thank you so much for your word to us this morning. Many of us from childhood have heard of uh, Daniel in the lion's den. We've seen all the flannel graph. But sometimes it goes right over our head what you're trying to speak to us through Daniel's life today. I pray we would see more than ever before this great need of prayer which serves as uh, cement for all the other things you accomplished in Daniel's life in chapters 1 and 6, he was able to do it because he had this personal connection with you. Now, while I'm speaking from without this morning, you're sitting there with your heads bowed and eyes closed. I wonder, has the Holy Spirit put his finger on your heart this morning? And maybe he's urging you once again to surrender your all to Jesus. If you've never before cried out to him for his salvation... I'm going to encourage you, I'm going to invite you in this service right now to do that. We're going to stand in just a moment. The praise uh, band is going to lead us in a, a wonderful song of surrender. And if God is tugging on your heart, wanting you to surrender, you're all to Jesus. You've never done that before. Why don't you do that during this time of invitation? As a believer in Jesus Christ, if there are some things that have a grip on you now, you're not able to shake them, and the fear of man has become a snare for you, and the more you try to get out of it, the tighter that thing gets, why don't you want to just, just come down to the altar this morning and get alone with God here and ask Him to help you, to trust in Him, to get freedom, and to be extracted from that particular difficulty. I just want to... Get in touch with God now during this invitation time. If he's spoken to your heart, I'm going to ask you to respond during this invitation. Father, we love you. Come and speak to our hearts now and help us to make some good decisions during this invitation time. I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. The words will be on the overhead. A song of surrender. And we want you to mean it as you sing it to the Lord, okay? I give you my life, I give you my trust, Jesus. And you are my God, and you are enough, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Take it all, take it all, my life. 
of a great God, don't we? Man, imagine a God that could reach down and stop the mouth of lions. These were real lions. But God can stop their mouths if necessary. Lord, you're so good to us. I thank you for this journey through the first six chapters of the book of Daniel. We saw the practical side of his life, how you really used him mightily in that environment. And pray again, you'd use our people in this current culture that we find ourselves in. And we thank you for the last part of the book of Daniel, too, the prophecies of Daniel. Pray we would continue to understand those principles and those prophecies clearer and clearer so that we might be looking forward to the soon, the imminent return of Jesus Christ. Would you please give us a healthy rest this afternoon and bring us back once again tonight where we can hear more about you and and be challenged and stirred and in worship through your word as we meet together in our small groups. We love you, and we ask you to make us a blessing now as we leave this place. In Jesus' name, amen.